Light of Eden by Nathaniel Klein. Narrated by Nathaniel Klein. Part 1. Dawn of Darkness. Introduction. The Night Before the Seventh Day. Wind embodied with ethereal life fluttered through the white veil of a glowing tent. In response to the intruding air, a single flame danced upon the spout of an oil lamp and cast wicked shadows across the inside of the canvas. Why do you still linger on your meditations? A disembodied voice spoke through the current of night air. You know what needs to be done. Next to the lamp laid an unrolled and tattered scroll. Ancient symbols lined the page, and tracing each character was the chipped nail of a crooked finger. It swept and flowed with artful strokes along each line, searching with diligent grace. Hooded and concealed by a dull gray cloak, a bent figure hovered over the parchment, his mind fixated and consumed by its every word. Void of even a whisper, the reader's cracks lips formed the ink lines, mouthing them before the eyes could even translate the next character into its meaning. The skies will write the end. A light of heaven will foretell of the coming darkness, and the earth shall open and swallow until nothing that was will remain the same. When but seven cycles remain, one will arise to set into order what was promised. Emboldened by light, he will seek by faith, but a second will embrace the wisdom of man. The past shall be intertwined, and angels and demons will dare utter of the sacred Othonium, the lost stones, the hope of man, the light of Eden. Chiseled into memory and forged slowly into understanding, the scroll was more than worn earth and strokes of ink. It was elements and essence combined, the visions of what is and what will be. The vague words were nevertheless untamable as the wind, but their presence was enough to tell of the storm to come. Let me into your mind, the voice petitioned. Flames flickered in orange waves across the re reader's irises, a burden some memory still fresh in his mind. Images haunted the weary soul playing every detail. Eyes swelling, a teardrop slipped free. Striking the parchment, it burned through the material with a ringlet of fire. The symbols were caught in the crimson ripple and crinkled away into ash. Vivid as the present, the past came to life. Every sense of that faded day returned. The scorching heat of the wild flames, the smell of the charred corpses, and the screaming helpless. Give me pause. The man dismissed the voice's request to read his own thoughts. Pause for useless pondering. The wind stirred up again, and the flame fluttered. Dawn will not wait. The memory replayed. He remembered the binding restraint of fear that fastened him to the temple wall overlooking the devastated village. Fingers clinging to the stone in cold sweat. He could not move, but stayed hidden in the shadow of the entranceway. It seemed an eternity dragged while his ears were forced to listen to the horrid cries echoing from inside the sacred temple kept secret by the righteous Kohamin of Mariance, his fellow priests. Despite the wail of the inflicted, a chant could be heard. Adonai the words were sung together as one beautiful voice. Though the chorus of voices diminished. The volume rose ever more till only one voice remained to repeat the blessing and then was silenced. Shalom. Not until all who had remained to protect the temple were slaughtered did the nine vessels return to the surface. Each wraith passed their unknown observer's hiding place like cold shadows, their breath dark prickling along his skin. Malevolent, their eyes were slanted without remorse of the wickedness that they had watched their hands commit. He did not know how long he waited in the darkness of that corner, but a fear beyond death finally pulled him free. Feet silent on the blood-stained steps, he traveled to the deepest corridor of the once holy sanctum. The stone floor of the final hall was so thick with blood it became a trickling stream and clutched at his feet like the ghostly hands of the dead reaching out for him. 
Light in the room beyond beckoned him closer until he paused in the archway. A single beam of sunlight let in through the opening high above shone down upon the altar in the center of a circular chamber. He understood now what had taken the vessel so long. Priests and servants of the temple were herded around the altar, with their bloodied fingers still clutching its golden frame. They had laid down their lives to protect the sacred relic, covering it with their own bodies. The servants of the dark had to cut through the young and the old, one by one. A hollow poison wormed into the channels of the man's heart while he gazed in dread at what had already been feared to be true. The multitude of lifeless hands, their arms supporting their limp bodies like tethers, surrounded the center altar upon which knelt the golden figurine of a Caruvium, with its wings covering its face and its hands held together, palms up. Centered on the Caruvium's open hands, the faint beam of light revealed the angel held nothing but the copper-scented air. He felt the haunting eyes of the spirits of the dead were upon him, petitioning his soul to reclaim what was taken before the fate of man was written in their blood. Each night he would toil, only the slow scratching of his finger on the coarse material and the gentle whisper of the wind to accompany him. However, unlike the countless nights before, the gloom of this current darkness held an omen that inflicted the astrologer with renewed vigor. Suddenly, and seemingly without cause, the steady gliding scratch paused. Then the finger retraced its path across a tear-shaped symbol and rested, its pointed nail digging into the spot. It was as his old mind remembered, only his eyes needed to see for themselves in order to believe it was true. After tightly rolling the parchment, the deft hands of the figure secured the elongated end of an unattached sword handle and slid the thin scroll inside the hollow length. On the adjacent end of the table rested a double-edged silver blade, the length of a man's forearm from elbow to fingertip. Elegant and sturdy, the sharpened gloss of the weapon absorbed the candlelight that sent dancing shimmers across its length. The blade's decorated handle was inserted, and with a quick jerk, both sections were locked together to form a magnificent short sword. I am ready. I hope your contemplations were worth the delay. Your friend has been awaiting you outside. After the weapon was secured in his belt, the lamp hissed as the figure suffocated the single flame with wetted fingertips and allowed the darkness to enter the tent. Rising from the table, he felt an icy chill from behind his eyes and then worm into the back of his skull. He shook off the feeling and stepped out into the night to greet the moon's silver ambience. The time is right. Our cause, just. You will know once I have laid hands upon it, replied the man to the empty air. Then he will have a reason to fear, not us. The heavenly sphere's radiance inspired a sapphire glow from a pair of irises lingering beneath the black facade of a hood. Eased away with a gradual sweep, the gray covering was lifted to reveal the aged face of a man with a bald head and a braided goatee of gray strands. Creases of tired age surrounded the sage's eyes while they searched the endless black above. A single star shone bright and alone, effulgent with a blue tint and a teardrop shape. Closer, the old man whispered to the night. A moonlit silhouette loomed behind the aged mortal, its arrival announced only by a stretched and contorted shadow that crept over the sage. Unafraid, the night watcher turned to face the cloaked, concealed specter. Erect to a menacing height was motionlessly poised a Nephilim. Behind the tarnished silver and chipped war visor masking its face, lay black and purple eyes that met the old man's own. The age master continued with an unsteady quiver in his words. So ever close. The sage's lips slanted into a roguish grin, and he drew the hood back into place. Come along, my ally. This night beckons our treachery. Cohen entered the palace courtyard at the center of the city, the marble floor awash with a dueling luminescence from both the torches and luminaries above. He stood a single pace from the grasp of the light and observed the proceedings. An ever-careful man, afraid of his own shadow, the king, Metushalek, commanded sentries at every pillar and a pair of eyes ten strides apart to top the walls. But not this night. The courtyard was vacant of its normal watch. Alone without his guard, Metushalek paced before the Nephilim. At first, Cohen did not even see the tiny form of a crouched mortal at the feet of Rengal, 
the larger brother. The man's torso was not even the width of the giant's calf. Thinner, but nonetheless a towering colossus, Murgal paced with boredom, eager to see the shedding of blood. Cohen could not clearly hear Matushalek as he questioned the man, so he came out of the shadows. He approached, but kept his distance. He filled his lungs with an air of confidence and relaxed his shoulders, his easy stride bringing him to Matushalek's side. If you truly do not know where the other relics are, Matushalek stood, stiff, his body motionless except for his right hand, which opened and closed almost as if involuntary. You must know who has hidden them. Cohen recognized the man now, the high priest of Miriance, the leader of the land that now lay burned at the hand of his king. The high priest raised his head. His veins were protruding from his grayed skin and his eyes bulging from swollen sockets. Instead of facing the demanding king before him, he turned to the Nephilim. Why do you not take the crown from this mortal and set yourselves on high above us? His body tremored from his torture as he raised three fingers to his forehead between his eyes, a sign of respect to the ancient gods. We would worship you, for you are our rightful Elohim. Matushalek's shimmering blue eyes dropped to his now open palm. But your gods obey my Eloha. He held out his right hand. A white stone was inlaid in his palm. It burned white hot like ore being smelted and was layered by dark purple spider-webbed veins. And he has blessed me with his eye. Ringal's glaive wrenched from its grip and spun in the air by its own power and turned to face the kneeling high priest. It rotated in gentle arcs, the blade coming closer to the man's neck with each revolution, whistling as it cut the night air. The angels in heaven combine spirits with elements like this stone. When a Nephilim is killed, his spirit, cursed, remains with the weapon that took his life. The high priest squirmed as the sharpened iron swung closer and closer. Damn creations formed from the cursed gods. Not much hope of redemption. We who are cast aside and overlooked are forced to band together. It is an abomination, the high priest shouted back. The glossy metal slowed and paused at the man's neck. Matushalek flicked his right hand, sending the weapon back to Rengal. I will let you die at the hands of your Elohim, Matushalek smiled beneath the brim of his hood. You have sacrificed the sons of your own people to the gods. Now it's time you placed your own blood upon the altar. The Nephilim laughed and tossed his glaive to his brother so he could dismember the human with his bare hands. Cohen stepped forward and with a steady arm severed the priest's head with one swift stroke. Before the baffled giant could retaliate for the stolen kill, the high guard turned to Matushalek. Forgive the intrusion, he spoke evenly as he cleaned the blade on his cloak before the sheathing. The wraith has sent me. Matushalek eyed the sword his high guard never wore. The stones. A watcher claiming to know the hiding places of the Orthonium has been captured. The wraith will not be able to contain him for long. Matushalek pulled back his white hood, revealing his aged face. Where? Above the falls. Father Hedeko, ordered the king. Bind the watcher. Bring him to me. Cohen turned in time to see the two Nephilim disappear over the courtyard balustrade that they hurled like a goat pen. His eyes focusing, he reached for the handle of his sword, but grasped empty air, startled his head jerked in reflex to scan behind him while his stance shifted, ready to spring into action if he needed to evade a surprise blow. Watchers. I thought them all to have been hunted down and bound in the heart of the earth. Matushalek stood, studying the high guard's weapon he had removed from Kohen in a single moment with a sweep of his arm. You were once a priest of Marians. This is why you are called Kohen, is it not? We give up our names, Kohen replied. When I left the temple, I had already served too many years to remember the name my mother had given me. Matushalek lifted his eyes from the blade and stared, unblinking. 
What did you think of the words of your high priest? Did his blaspheme warrant your death stroke? The righteous of Marion served only the one true Eloha. Cohen extended an upturned palm toward the headless body upon the stone floor. Men like him are why I broke my oath to the temple. Matushalek nodded his head softly. My vessels tell me those of the temple called upon Adonai as they were butchered. But you know this. You were there, were you not? Matushalek took a step toward the high guard. And now, after all these years, you will break your oath again and betray me, Matushalek proceeded without waiting for a response. You know that the Watchers lost their ability to shapeshift after their seed spread across the land. My father, Hanok, did this to them. He had their ability to transform into physical creatures, like a normal man, taken away and sealed them within the earth. Only a few remain to wander now, forced to exist beyond sight. These Watchers taught us all we know, but I do believe even they have kept secrets. This world can only be united if these truths are known to all men. He halted by the door to the king's chambers, behind them at the end of the inner courtyard of the palace. We need to speak in private. You should not trust the ears you keep closest. He extended an open arm past the doorway. Matushalek eyed Cohen curiously before joining his side. He paused at the doorway and placed Cohen's sword in the high guard's hands. It's not ears I distrust, but tongues, he whispered with a grin before climbing the staircase to his chamber. Cohen followed, fighting to keep the tremor in his hands from giving him away. He took the last stair, gripping the cold metal of his sword for strength. My king. Matushalek raised a hand for the high guard to hold his tongue. I sense a divine hand upon you. Nine hundred years has not made me senile and weak as some may have surmised. Cohen could feel his lungs cease their movement inside his chest. You know me better, my king. I've lived in fear, clinging to my throne for centuries, endless battles, betrayals, giants, and now these uprisings have all taught me rigid politics. Matushalek eyed his glowing hand, its white and violet aura filling the dim chamber with holy illumination. As when Hasatan turned upon the throne and knew he could destroy his creator, I see clear the truth. I have nothing to fear from you and your watcher. Without warning, the angel cast himself from the shadow of the spiritual realm and clasped hold of Matushalek's hand. Drained from the air, the white glow absorbed into the Athornium. The king struggled to summon the stone's powers, but its strength had become dormant. I am no ordinary watcher, simply banished for the lust of flesh, shouted the seraphim. I fashioned Hillel's raiment. I know its properties more than you, mortal. Matushalek laughed, his lips formed into a malevolent grin. His hand began to glow, and the angel struggled to contain it. Do it now! shouted the watcher. Cohen rushed to a chest at the center of the chamber and flung it open. He pulled two gems from the inside, one violet and attached to a chain, and the other a round emerald. He wrapped the necklace around his sword hand and pressed the gem firmly into the handle. The sword spouted sparks of energy, and he pointed it at Matushalik. Lightning crackled from the blade and latched upon the king and sent him sprawling across the chamber floor. Cohen took the green orb and clasped it firmly in his gauntleted hand. The silver metal erupted with ghostly green flames as the high guard approached his foe with both weapons burning away the darkness. In a blur of color, a sword and gauntlet struck the air around the king. Despite his skill with the blade and relentless barrage of strikes, he could not land a single blow. Matushalek rolled to a crouched stance to place distance between them, his leathery arms outstretched. The silver high guard's armor jarred as if hit by an invisible hammer. Dents from the unseen fingers continued to deform the metal, Cohen unable to break free of its grasp. The iridescent glow from the earthornium blinded the high guard. He was lifted in the air, his feet trying to grasp the tiles below him. 
With a slash of his sword, lightning tore across the room, shredding the curtains, the tattered pieces spinning around in a cyclone. Kohan smashed the armor from his chest with the emerald, and he fell to the floor. He came at the king with his fist high and blade low, hiding his strike. The gauntlet seemed to crash into Matushalik's palm with a clash of flame and light. Time seemed to stop, and the glow intensified to surround the combatants. Kohan's sword drifted, slowed to a near halt, though he pressed it forward with all his might. Matushalek pushed the fiery gauntlet away to grasp the electric blade before it pierced his side. Their eyes locked, the torn current still whirling about like ghosts in the pulsing glow that encompassed them in a vibrant fog. There is no one left in any kingdom of man that serves him, Matushalek breathed into Okoen's face. He will destroy his own creations, for he cares not for man any more. The high guard's sword began to shake, and the metal seemed about to shatter. If Yahweh desires to take me, then I will go. He reached across with his fiery left hand and clutched the king's wrist. Planting his heel into Matushalek's chest, he pried his sword free. With a spray of hot blood, the thorium was cut free and sailed through the air, and the white light was immediately drawn into it and clanked upon the marble below. Spiritual objects draining them of their energy, both men collapsed and lay unconscious, the chamber now silent. The watcher moved toward Kohen to see that his heart still beat, and his spirit still resided within him. Well thought, priest. The seraphim looked out upon the city from the windows and saw the sun beginning to rise. He crouched beside the fallen king. He still drew breath. The empty, veinous gash in his hand was blackened, and the fingers of his hand were twitching, clawing at the air. The watcher placed an outstretched hand above Matushalik's head. Dream, he whispered. Dream of the destruction to come. His eyes gradually lifted to where the Orthornium lay. He moved it and swept his hand across the marble floor to retrieve it, but the glowing stone only shimmered like a mirage. Rising, he caused a gentle wind to pull what remained of the tattered curtains across the windows. He could see the morning guard returning to their stations across the sunlit courtyard. The city of Orton was waking. Enjoy your rest now, but rise soon. Our journey will be long.